Hi, and welcome to Civil Service Live, the civil service's flagship event that is designed to educate, to empower, and to engage thousands of civil servants across the country. Tonight's session is no different. It will be on Parliament. We'll be discussing the challenges politicians face, stories within the Palace of Westminster, and Parliament's function, its place in our democracy. I have a very special guest with me, but before I get onto that, I'd like to remind you that this is a live Q&A event and we will be taking questions from the audience. So while you're adjusting your seat, making a cup of tea or coffee, feel free to write your questions in the chat bar and our moderators will select your questions throughout the interview. Thank you. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our very special guest. He is the leader of the House of Commons, Conservative MP for North East Somerset. He was elected in 2010, shortly after graduating from the University of Oxford. He went to work for the city and in the city. Shortly co-founded a asset management firm called Somerset Capital. He is known for his double-breasted suits and eloquent speeches, um, which has earned this distinguished politician a devoted following. Please raise a hand for the Right Honourable Jacob Rees-Mogg. Jacob. Thank you so much. What a very flattering introduction. Thank you. A flattering but accurate one. Um, before we get into the substantive questions, I thought it would be a good idea for the audience to get to know a bit more about you. And so we've come up with a true or false icebreaker game. I'll read out a series of statements and all you have to say is true or false with a very short backstory no longer than a sentence or two. Okay. Are you ready? Great. So you started investing in the stock market at just 10 years old and you attended board meetings where you asked CEOs very tough questions. Well, that's actually true. I went along to annual general meetings and asked companies to pay bigger dividends to their shareholders and things like that. Wow. And I was quite young at the time. 10, 10, is, uh, 10 is quite early. You currently live in a former Red Cross hospital where your great aunt was a nurse. That, that's absolutely right. It became a hospital during the First World War. It was a recuperation hospital in Somerset and my great aunt uh, worked there as a volunteer throughout its period from 1915 until it closed in 1919. Wow. And this is an interesting one. You make your own cider. I do, yes. Uh, we've got four or five apple trees, we get hundreds of apples, and we got fed up having endless apple pie and didn't want to waste them. So a few years ago, we started making cider, and it's really very good. If anybody pops in to see me in the House of Commons, I can give them a glass of cider. Perhaps we'll, we'll, that's an offer for as a lot of civil servants will take you up on that. Um, you've got a filing cabinet, a secret filing cabinet, full of 90s hip-hop tapes. I'm afraid that's so secret that I don't know where it is, and I'm not entirely sure I know what 90s hip-hop tapes would be either. So no, I'm afraid that one's false. Okay. You recently turned down an opportunity to star in the popular TV series Line of Duty. That, I'm afraid, is also false. The, 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 I did get asked to do a celebrity bake-off once, but I'm afraid I declined that opportunity as well. But no, no, no requests to be on Line of Duty. Okay. Um, at your first year of Oxford University, you were nominated the title of Pushy Fresher by the student paper. That is absolutely correct, yes. I think because I've made too many speeches in the Oxford Union, so that won't surprise anybody. You're half American? Quarter American. So that's sort of half true, half false. My, my grandmother, my father's mother was American. I see. And in your second year of, at Oxford, you auditioned for the role of Bertie Wooster in the stage, adap in the stage adaptation of a P.G. Woodhouse novel. Oh, if only that were true. And um, what fun that would have been. But no, sadly, I've never auditioned uh, to be Bertie Wooster. I just do it naturally. <laughs> I think um, this, is, this calls for perhaps delving a bit deeper into Parliament. And for my opening question, what I'd like to sort of do is set the scene. During the pandemic, civil servants have made tremendous sacrifices to keep essential services running. The civil service has also played an instrumental role in a highly successful vaccine rollout. They've worked incredibly hard to ensure businesses and cities in general are able to reopen. And they've also been working hard on securing post-Brexit trade deals. 
However, there are thousands of civil servants that work in frontline operational customer facing roles that live and work outside of the Westminster bubble. Why should they care about Parliament? More broadly, why should civil servants care about Parliament? It's a very good question because I'm very conscious of the fact that to become a civil servant, you're in the far stream, you have to be highly qualified and you have to be extremely clever. But to be a politician, you don't have to have any qualifications at all. I say this sometimes when I'm visiting schools and it doesn't go down well with the teachers. You can fail all your exams and still become a politician. So you are the elite in many senses and you do an incredible public service. So why does Parliament matter? First of all, it legitimises. Power, the use of power, needs to be legitimised. And we've seen that, I think, very importantly during the pandemic. But we have been governed by consent. that people have accepted these limitations on their freedoms because they recognised the legitimacy of the government that was imposing them. Just imagine if it had been a purely bureaucratic suggestion that we couldn't visit each other in our own homes. I think there would have been a great deal of resentment. So Parliament legitimises, but Parliament is also the means of making sure that things go right. Um, and I've been really impressed by this in my 11 years as an MP. We all make mistakes, part of the human condition to make mistakes. But when a constituent comes to a Member of Parliament, the Member of Parliament, by writing to somebody within the civil service, can get this put right. And we all have a vested interest in good government and people being served well. And the link between the elector and the parliamentarian helps improve the way we're governed and helps people lead um, easier lives. And I think that's crucial. On that specific point about constituents writing to their MPs, you recently helped secure a very expensive, potentially life-saving drug for a young boy in your constituency diagnosed with Batten disease. Mm. Um, what's the power of a backbench MP? The power of a backbencher is, first of all, most of the people you're dealing with want to help people. You're not dealing with faceless bureaucrats who are there to be difficult. I'm dealing with people like you, flesh and blood people who have the same feelings and emotions and desired help that politicians do. And that's really important because when you get a letter saying there is a poor child who needs help, your immediate instinct is how do I help, not how do I not help. So remembering that you're dealing with people is important, not some blob or mechanism that has no feelings. So then how do you push the case? First of all, by making a decent argument, it's really important to remember that in the House of Commons, the government may win the vote every day, but if it doesn't win the argument as well, ultimately, it will not succeed. And so you have to win the argument as well as the vote. And so as a backbench MP, if you've got a good argument, that's important. And I'm afraid the third point is just by making a thorough nuisance of yourself. So if you um, ask questions, um, of the Secretary of State, of the Prime Minister, if you ask for adjournment debates, if you put down urgent questions, eventually people come to the conclusion that it's easier to give in, to let you have what you're asking for your constituent, rather than have to go through this constant pressure and bombardment and inconvenience um, of, of the parliamentary mechanisms that are available. It's interesting because in order to make your case, in order for the government to make its case, it needs to persuade and some may argue that persuasion is, is best done in person, in a, in a chamber. During the lockdown, many of us have been forced to work from home, as well as politicians. I'm curious, do you feel like something's missing by not having your colleagues with you sitting in the chamber? And how has remote working affected Parliament's ability to effectively scrutinise the government? Um. To rewind to when the pandemic hit, we were initially worried that it wouldn't be possible to have any scrutiny at all. The Parliament would simply have to go on a long recess uh, because we didn't know that the technology would work, we didn't know that it was going to be possible to have remote sittings and so on. And I thought at that time it was really important that some degree of scrutiny continued. But it is unquestionably less good. It is much easier as a Minister of Dispatch Box to get through a difficult question time when there's nobody actually in the chamber. Why? Because you don't get 
that build up tension you've got when you've got a room full of people, you don't get the noise that you get, and you get, don't get the spontaneity. The hardest questions are the ones that you don't expect. And when in a debate you're in full flood and somebody opposite stands up and intervenes and asks you a question to which you have no idea of the answer, that's when the government is really scrutinised. When it's all set speeches, people ringing in and speaking for three minutes, the challenge of scrutiny is much less. So it's better than nothing, but the sooner we're back to normal, the better for the scrutiny of the government. And in my view, scrutiny leads to better government because it helps governments avoid mistakes and it helps them to understand the mood of the voter outside the Westminster bubble. On your podcast, you spoke about the hidden considerations uh, by the government of how to handle parliament. You also said something along the lines of um, if these considerations are, are, are secret or not public, this is not less democratic, but it's more democratic. And you spoke about the dark matter of parliament. Could you elaborate on the concept of dark matter? Yes, I'll try to at any rate. It fascinates me. <clears throat> that when you look at government from the outside, you see the government with a big majority and it plows through with a legislative programme and it wins the votes and what it's wanted to legislate for just happens. But that misses out the dark matter, which is what happens before the legislation is introduced or as the government introduces amendments to the legislation, because there are endless conversations going on uh, between the government and backbenchers and peers to find out what Parliament thinks is acceptable, to learn from what is going on in the country at large. And so the appearance is of a very powerful government just deciding what it wants to do and going ahead. But it's much more democratic than that. It's really interesting that I chair the PBR committee, which looks at legislation. And every time we have a bill coming before us, there is a handling plan. And the handling plan will list every MP and peer who's interested in the subject and will have discussed the issue with them or an understanding of their views. That, so those are actually fed into the process long before the individual member stands up at the second reading and says, this is brilliant or this is terrible. And so you get much more of a back and forth than it appears if you just look at what happens in public. And I think that's very democratic because it involves a wider number of people and a greater um, um, variety of views. It's interesting um, when, at least when I'm watching PMQs, that there's um, something really refreshing about the adversarial nature of British politics. You once described John MacDonald as a, a very charming man, yet you couldn't be more ideologically opposed. I think people at home are wondering does the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition secretly get on? But more generally to that, what's the relationship like between politicians outside of the chamber? Um, I don't know specifically about the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition, but I certainly get on with my shadow, Thang Bukner, and her predecessor, Valerie Baz, both of whom it's been an absolute pleasure working alongside. And there are many things we need to do collaboratively in terms of how the House is run and on the House of Commons Commission. Um, I think the thing to remember is that we all want the same thing. We all want to help our constituents and improve their lives. I agree with you, adversarial politics is really important. Uh, I like the idea that you have a tough debate and the ideas bang up against each other and the strongest ideas succeed. I think that's a good way of doing things. But that doesn't mean you don't like the people you're doing it with. Um, I have a number of cross-party friendships. I'd embarrass the poor old leader of the SNP in the Commons in Blackford because we've been friends for 20-odd years. We knew each other in our city days. He is a very, very decent man. I completely disagree with his view of my country. I don't want it split up. I'm not a separatist. But is he somebody uh, who is honest and decent and wants what he thinks is best for the people of Scotland? Yes, of course he is. That is a very refreshing take, especially... Sometimes our politics can feel a bit partisan. It can feel a bit tribal uh, at times. And, and so it should be at times, because these decisions are really important decisions. So if Ian and I are debating in the chamber of the House of Commons, we shouldn't give each other any quarter, because how you think your country should be structured is pretty fundamental. 
just because we might have dinner together occasionally, it doesn't mean that the debate should be any the less when it takes place, nor does it mean that it is any way um, confected when we have that debate. It is a real debate about important issues. You were elected or appointed, I should say, as leader of the House and president of the Council in 2019. What do those two roles mean in practice? Um, well, as leader of the House, I'm responsible for the business in the House and for chairing the EVL committee, which is there to approve legislation coming through. So that's about, in a way, the nuts and bolts of the government parliament relationship. So I have to make sure the government can get its business through the Commons, but also uh, I have to ensure that members of the Commons are treated properly by the government. So this is things like chasing up written questions that haven't been answered or um, letters that haven't been answered or responding to the request for debate. Not that I can always give them, but if there's a great strength of feeling in the House that something should be debated, then that case needs to be made within government um, on behalf of Parliament. So there's that role. And then the President of the Council is great because the Privy Council, other than the monarchy itself, is the oldest institution of our constitution. Now, most of its powers have long since disappeared that technically the cabinet is committed to the Privy Council. So most of it is formulaic, but it's quite fun. What's it like working in close quarters with the Queen? Um, well, I think that's rather a kind way of putting it. I mean, the, 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 the Lord President of Council obviously presides at the Privy Council and the Queen is present. But I think it would be overstating my importance to say I was working with the Queen. But being in the presence of the Queen is very exciting. The Queen just has such a link with history. And if you think that her grandfather, who she knew, was the King during the First World War, it is part of the um, a thread that links us right back through our history, through the kings and queens, um, centuries of the conquest, and indeed before that, if you wish. And that I think is important. And um, everything you've ever read about the queen, when you get to meet her, is true that um, she is very amusing. Uh, she is completely charming and kindly um, and unbelievably beautiful. As, as you know, the Privy Council meets standing up. The Queen is 95, and the Queen stands um, when it's physical for the whole of the Privy Council and for the Lord President's audience beforehand and for the chat that we have afterwards. It's quite something. Not many people that age are standing for quite that long. I think most people my age wouldn't be able to stand that <laughs> long. Um, it's... it's um... So we've got approximately two minutes left before we move on to audience questions. Something that I've been thinking about is, could you perhaps speak on the merits of a constitutional monarchy um, versus a presidential system? Yes, I think a constitutional monarchy has the benefit of having somebody who is a unifying figure for the nation where a president, an elected president, is a divisive figure. I think that you have that wise council at the top that represents the nation abroad very successfully, as we've seen with the G7, uh, but also is a completely confidential sounding board for the prime minister. And those audiences, I think, have been very important to prime ministers. Um, so, and you have a link with your history that is of symbolic importance. With an elected executive presidency, you create division within your society, as we've seen very much in the United States in the last few years, rather than bringing people together. And when the nation is represented abroad, you bring your domestic politics into what is happening with your foreign affairs. And I don't think that is advantageous. I think a constitutional monarchy works extremely well. It's very beneficial for um, our constitutional settlement. That is really Good answer. And I think many people will be quoting it. Well, I would just say it's nothing to do with tourism. I cannot bear it when people say, oh, we're so lucky we have a monarch and it leads to a bit of tourism. No, it's completely trivial. Very nice to have tourism, but our constitutional settlement is not about attracting a few people to watch the changing of the guard. I'm, I'm quite happy that you've brought that argument because a lot of people who are perhaps identified as Republicans uh, often debunk 
the tourism statistics. So it's, it's refreshing to see another. We've got a few questions from the audience and I'm just going to read them. Um, one person asked, what do you think we can do to make Parliament more inclusive and appealing to those from a variety of diverse backgrounds? Um, I think you want to look at that question in two different ways. One is, how do you get people from all backgrounds to contact their member of parliament? This is an issue that as a constituent MP worries me. I know who comes to see me in my surgeries, I know who writes to me, and I know that if they have got a good case, I can usually get things put right for them. What I worry is about is the people who don't know how to contact their MP. So we all have a job of work to do to say, if you've got a problem, go to your member of parliament. Because actually some people who come to me come too late. And if they come to me a bit earlier, I might have been able to help. And I'm sure there are people who simply don't think that the service is available. And then there's who you have as your member of parliament and how that can uh, better reflect the nation at large. And that, I think, is responsibility of people like me, but other politicians, to go around and talk to people. And it is why when I go into schools, I say, look, any one of you in this school can stand for Parliament once you're 18. There is no barrier. And I think we have improved in recent years. But we want to do better. We want people to feel, as they do in America, in America, school children are told, any one of you can grow up to become President of the United States. I think we really ought to bang that message home in our schools, in our universities, when politicians go out and about. But anyone who wants to can grow up to be Prime Minister of this country, and to do that, they have to become a member of parliament, therefore anyone can grow up to be a member of parliament. And it's I, a worthy ambition. I think that's incredibly um, important to say. Recently, the civil service had a commission, Social Mobility Commission, look at the makeup of the civil service. Um, and it kind of described progressing throughout the civil service as a labyrinth um, and different, different factors that may not be entirely linked to one's ability being responsible for their progression. My question to you is, what do you think can be done within political parties, perhaps, and even outreach projects to make Parliament a more meritocratic place? I, mean, I think with the civil service, the Northcote Trevelyan reforms were very important. And you always want to hark back to those that what goes on in the civil service should be done on merit and should be promoting able people and that ability is fundamental. And we're very lucky. I mean, I, um, I'm not just on this to flatter everybody, but I have been so struck in my two years in government by the high quality of civil servants and their ability to be apolitical, which really surprised me because before I got in, um, I didn't quite think you were all a bunch of communists, but um, I was quite suspicious of the political views of civil service. And I found that the ability to work for any government is impeccable, really impressive. Uh, but it's really important that the meritocracy in the civil service remains and that there's no effort to lower the quality to be um, to, to achieve other objectives. That makes sense. With MPs, it's different because you want MPs to some extent to represent all levels of ability across the nation. Uh, and there's a lot of good sense across the nation. If you believe in democracy, you believe that the um, individual voter going out to vote has good sense, and that we want all of them to be represented from uh, a wide variety of backgrounds, but also of achievements. Uh, you want some who are very high achieving, but you don't want everybody to be um, in the Olympic equivalent of whatever their field of life is, because that doesn't represent society at large. I'm afraid you civil servants all have to be the equivalent of Olympic athletes in your field, but politicians need to be broader. Now, how do parties do that? They go out and find people, they ask people to come in. We're always knocking on doors. When I knock on doors and somebody speaks to me and has a strong view, I say, well, what on earth aren't you standing for Parliament? Even if it's not for my party, you believe in things. Please get involved. And it's as much by influence and encouraging uh, as by formal edicts, which don't necessarily change that much. That's interesting. And I think it's, uh, like you said, it's, it's making people feel comfortable that they can apply and put themselves forward. Someone's asked, any funny remote parliament stories to share <clears throat> from the past 25 months of many MPs dialing in remotely? Hopefully nothing as extreme as 
the handful of parish council meetings. Nothing quite as bad as that. One, one MP, um, when she thought the microphone had gone off, did start swearing, um, which was slightly unfortunate. So <laughs> that's some blue language coming through, and blue not in the conservative fashion. Um, you've had one or two people who uh, have been um, cut off midstream when they make them particularly wound up. And we did have one MP coming on Zoom and complaining why wasn't the House of Commons getting back to normal? Which I'm afraid my rather obvious reply was, why on earth aren't you in the chamber at least beginning to get it back to normal? So we've had one or two. But actually, the funniest we had was in um, the Privy Council on Zoom uh, when the fire alarm in the Cabinet Office went off in the middle of it. And waiting um, to pay homage to the Queen was the now Archbishop of York. So he was sort of um, locked in this place, waiting to come in. The alarm went off. He had to be rescued. Then there was a protest outside. He was fully <laughs> robed to pay homage to the Queen. And it was all very chaotic. That is quite funny. Um, I'm just scrolling through a few. Someone's asked, if you had to be part of Parliament in another country, which would it be and why? More broadly, any lessons that we can learn from other countries in how they run their parliaments? Oh, I think if I weren't a member of the UK Parliament, which I would rather be than anything else, and a member of the House of Commons, which I, I think to represent one's country in the House of Commons is the most exciting honour that one could have, I think to be a US Senator would be quite fun. Um, I, I, I think the US Senate is an amazing body. Its history is absolutely fascinating. Um, so if that's the choice you're offering me, uh, I'd have to go to my American grandmother's side of the family and scoot over there. But what can we learn? We can learn different ways of running things and we can see whether we think they're better or worse. And America is obviously a place we look at because it has a clear separation of powers and a government that is not in the Congress, and a Congress of equally powerful parts. Now, this does one very important thing, is that it ensures that any change has a great consensus across the nation. It's really hard for one party to round things through, whereas here it's really easy for one party to round things through. On the other hand, it leads to gridlock, and it leads to a very powerful Supreme Court. And I think it's worth looking at that and seeing whether that is a system that in principle we prefer to the one that we've got, where it's very easy to change things and you can change fundamental things um, just on majority of one effectively in the House of Commons and using the Parliament Act if necessary, but we're very fleet of foot and which, which is preferable. And those are essentially the two extremes you've got of, of governments. I think ours works in a non-federal system and the US works in a federal system because in a federal system uh, you need to have that greater consensus so that you carry all the states with you. Whereas here we've got a more direct democracy to the um, national voter and therefore our flexibility works well. But that's where I would focus my um, study. What do you make of um, rainbow coalitions that we see in other European nations? We, we had a taste of it with the Hong Kong um, People have different views. I'm just curious, well, I think, what's yours? Well, it may not surprise you, I think they're absolutely dreadful because I think they represent nobody. Uh, and you go out to vote, I mean, in, in, in Germany, you vote the party of the left and the party of the right, and you end up with them coming together and ruling anyway. And I think that's just a very odd way of operating democratically because nobody voted for that. Mm. Whereas our system, you get party in charge for which 40% plus of people have voted. The drawback to coalitions is that you give the greatest power to potentially the smallest party. And I don't think that is democratic. I think it's more democratic to the greatest part of the party that has a plurality of the seats in parliament and plurality of the vote. That makes sense. Someone's asked, how far away from the chamber have you been when the division bells have rung? And did you make it there in time before they locked the doors? Uh, yes, um, I live not very far from the Houses of Parliament and I can, at a quick walk, get in within eight minutes to vote. Uh, and so I have sometimes been at home and got in. Years ago, I was a newly elected member. I was invited to a dinner with Cardinal Pell 
the Australian cardinal who was traduced by um, the courts and had a very difficult time to now completely exonerated. Um, and I think back in the Vatican, a very good man. Um, but every um, time I got back to the dinner, the division bell went off again and off I had to go and vote. And that was in the IEA in Lord North Street, which was pretty much the full eight minutes. And I did it four or five times. It was very embarrassing. <laughs> this great figure constantly rushing off to vote. Uh, I very, very rarely missed votes. I've never missed it because I didn't get to the um, division to, to the division in time. I once missed it because I was in um, uh, St Mary's Undercroft, the chapel. For a, I was listening to a lecture actually on the chapel and the architecture of it. Um, and the security guard at the top said he would shout down when there was division. Unfortunately, he'd gone off duty, and the next one didn't. And there's no mobile reception down there, so I missed. I missed a vote on that occasion. Oh, that's a shame. Um, but it's very disciplined that you've timed your your commute or your walk to the to the chamber. Um, someone's someone's made an interesting point here, and I think this comes back to Parliament being accessible to all. You said parliamentary procedures and protocols rules are sometimes obscure, and some are very rarely used. So, how do you and colleagues maintain your knowledge of them? and use them appropriately. Do you have a team whose job it is to know them all? Um, the clerks know them all. I've got here standing orders and a skin mail. Um, I, I, as an MP, I've spent a lot of time trying to understand the standing orders and the rules of Parliament. Um, it's not essential to being able to do your job as an MP. It, it's quite interesting if that's your interest. And it gives you a good understanding of the Constitution, but you can be an extremely effective parliamentarian without having read Erskine May. But there are clerks who you consult, can consult who are absolutely brilliant. They, their knowledge is extraordinary and they're very helpful at sharing it. I, I have uh, an advisor within my office as leader of the House who is there to guide me on parliamentary procedure. But a couple of weeks ago in the chamber, Somebody criticised Lord Hall and called for his peerage to be taken away. And I said, well, that can only be done by act of attainder. And I, I don't think that's been done since the 18th century. As I was leaving, the clerk said to me, uh, you're right about act of attainder. The last one was 1798. And their knowledge is phenomenal and immediately to hand. That is quite interesting. And um, I just want to circle back to something again. I know this theme of accessibility keeps coming back, but to some new MPs, Parliament can be quite a daunting place. Hogwarts, as Angela Rayner calls it. What, what would your advice be to, to new MPs, MPs that have been newly elected and they're overwhelmed by the rules and the environment of Parliament? I think to all new MPs, it's an overwhelming place. Uh, I think this idea that you know a lot of MPs come in and think, oh, it's just like an ordinary job. It's just not right. This is an amazing building. It is the beating heart of the oldest democracy in the world. It ought to be awe-inspiring, oughtn't it? It's so important and that honour that you have, you are the person representing your 70,000 constituents and doing your bit for them to be their champion. If you don't think that that is a great responsibility and something of the utmost seriousness, well, you probably shouldn't be doing it in the first place. So what advice would I give? Well. First of all, remember why you're here. You're not here because of you, you're here because of that mandate from your voters. And that gives you certain responsibilities, but also certain rights, that you have a right to be here and to speak your mind and to vote. The whips can advise you, but they can't tell you. Um, I also think people, when they come here, should absorb what goes on. They should sit in the chamber, which has been difficult, obviously, recently, to work out how things operate. They should remember that this is their parliament and wander about it. Open every door, go wherever they like, get to know it, become comfortable with it. And also remember that everyone in parliament is really here to help MPs do our legislative job. And if you ask people, it's amazing how helpful they're willing to be, whether this is somebody who's been in Parliament for years as an MP, the doorkeepers who know everything that's going on, the clerks, the library staff, people are here to help MPs do their job. 
and ultimately to help our constituents. I think we should clip that answer and have it as an audio file uh, somewhere in the parliament database for, for new MPs. Um, I'm just flicking through some of the answers, some of the questions we've received. Someone's asked, were there any positive aspects of moving Parliament online that you think we should take forward as we return to normal? I think the one really beneficial uh, part of it has been for select committees being able to have um, witnesses remotely which they were actually allowed to do before, but just hadn't done, and realising that they could do it. Um, the witness doesn't necessarily need to be physically present. You don't lose very much by having a witness uh, appearing remotely. And it means that you can get more witnesses more easily because um, they don't all have to come to London to do it. And one of the challenges for Parliament is to avoid being completely London-centric. Uh, as regards the Chamber, um, I'm very keen to go back to proper physical appearances. There's so much that goes on around the chamber. Just chatting to a minister saying there is this problem, can you sort it out, which you can't do on Zoom. Chatting to your colleagues to see where policy is going, you know, all the dark matter that you lose when people aren't around. If there's one parliamentary convention that you could change, what would it be and why? Um, what would I change? I'm in favour of conventions that are there to serve a useful purpose, not things that are conventions in themselves. Um, I would look at the rules on moving to sit in private, uh, which are used on um, Friday mornings and have become faintly ridiculous, and, and just sort of um, show rather than any genuine purpose. Following your considered response around the value of the UK being a constitutional monarchy, I am interested to hear your thoughts on the role of the House of Lords and the benefits it brings to the UK. Um, it was Badgett who said the cure for admiring the House of Lords was to go and look at it um, and see it in action. And there's a certain element of truth in that, that the Lords uh, is good in parts. And the part in which it's good is very important. The ability to ask the House of Commons to think again is really crucial constitutionally. But the Lords needs to remember that it is not the democratic house and it shouldn't try to insist. I think recently it's become too party political. And I think it needs to go back to where it was 20, 30 years ago when it would ask once, but it wouldn't try to insist on its views. It's, it's interesting because when you, you know, step in to the House of Lords and you watch uh, a session, they seem a lot more deferential. Um, I don't know if that's a maturity in its members, whether the fact that they're, all, they're all experts in their field. And they're not all experts in their fields. I mean, this sadly is a myth. Um, a lot of them are former MPs. Mm. And so they are just as expert as they were as when they were MPs. Just because they put on ermine doesn't suddenly make them great experts. That's there are some who are great experts who have got the field marshals <laughs> and the retired admirals and so on. Uh, and some but fewer judges than you used to have. But actually the bulk of the House of Lords are people no more expert than members of the Commons. Someone said something I think is quite interesting. Can we still rely on everyone following conventions or do we still need a codified written constitution? Oh, no, that's a great question. Um, I think an uncodified constitution is part of the flexibility that we enjoy and is part of the core democratic strength that we have. As soon as you codify it, you have to have a constitutional court. As soon as you have a constitutional court, you take power from the democratic part and give it to the judicial part. And I think there are concerns about judicial activism in recent years anyway, and that would make that more acute. And I would back um, our democratic arm always because I think governing by consent is much more powerful than ultimately governing by judges. So we, we have five minutes left for closing remarks and I'm, I'm slightly torn because I know not everyone's managed to have their questions answered. What's interested me most about this conversation is not only the anecdotes you've shared and the very personal nature 
politics. We, we, we often view politicians as sort of a distant um, entity, really. They're, they're in this house and they're in this echo chamber. But when you told me about your, your, your personal experience of representing your constituent um, and, and securing that life drug, a life-saving drug, and the very di direct nature of our democracy, it, it, it does engender a, a degree of hope. I'm also interested in hearing about perhaps some challenges that you've experienced as a politician. Well, I would agree with you. I, mean, I, I, I think the most important work I do, and what I will look back on when I've retired with the greatest pride, are things like getting the drug for the child with Batten disease, um, like um, uh, constituents. I, I was canvassing the last election, I knocked on lady's door and said, can I count on your support? And she said, of course you can, because the house I'm living in, you help me get. And you don't do this every week, but out of your surgery work, every so often, you do something for a constituent that changes that constituent's life for the better. And that is ultimately what it's all about, and that is ultimately much more important than the grand speeches or all the other things that are the baubles of public life, rather than helping people one by one. And what are the challenges? Uh, the challenges are when you think that something is still unfair and you can't do anything about it. Um, and sometimes this is because uh, people have come to you too late uh, and they've used up other avenues that therefore mean you can't get back to what you would be able to do as a member of parliament. Or sometimes government is obdurate. And there's one thing that really interests me, and this is the extent to which uh, government doesn't want to correct mistakes made by government sometimes decades ago. And if you look at Hillsborough, <coughs> which has now had inquiries and the reports have been accepted, it took years for that to happen. And I don't understand why governments are so defensive about things that happened well before the government of the day was in charge. And that is a frustration in politics, when you see things that ought to be changed, and yet you find it almost impossible to do. I think that is a, a very good note to end on. Um, we've, we've got two minutes left. And firstly, I want to thank you um, for your knowledge, your anecdotes, your grace, your wisdom. I think the people tuning in today have an immense amount to go back and reflect on, to read on, to think about the value of a constitutional democracy, um, to, to think about not only what are our differences are, but what we can learn from other nations, what the struggles and the challenges have been, the value of backbench MPs, why civil servants should care about parliament, the hidden interactions and considerations um, about how government handles parliament. And I would like to thank everyone who's tuned in today. Uh, I know you live incredibly busy lives. Some of you have children, some of you are working in operational roles. But this is a fantastic opportunity. If you haven't uh, done so already, Jacob has a podcast as leader of the house, um, which you can find on YouTube. And this will be recorded. So please feel free to share this episode once it comes out. Go away and, and think about the things we've discussed. Discuss them with your colleagues. Discuss them with your friends. And never judge a book by its cover. Who knows, maybe um, people can share their thoughts over a glass of your cider. Well, I would say as a final thought, any civil servant is always welcome to visit the House of Commons. Once we're back to normal, please come, sit in the public gallery or in the ministerial box and see what it's like. Thank you for tuning into Civil Service Live. It's been a pleasure, Jacob Rees-Mogg, and it's been a pleasure having you tune in.